Hello, I'm a Chris Athanas. I'm a KMP developer, and I'm going to continue the series, uh, how to program from the ground up. Uh, today, uh, oh yeah, tech support's coming out Tuesday. They said they promised this time. We'll see. Um, okay. Uh, so yeah, the, so now we're just putting it all together so that we have the, you know, the, the CPU, MPU thing together, but now you still have to hook up stuff to it, like RAM. You know, random access to make some memory. You have some some kind of something to boot it from, so it, you know, it just doesn't come from nothing. So you have to have some ROM. Um, and yes, the big idea is uh, instead of instead of hardwiring all the devices for a computer to you know together to the computer, because uh, it was <laughs> in the early days, this thing people just rolling their own different designs, and you know there was you know plugs internally like so they could break it apart and put it back together easier, but they're all protect. All the plugs are proprietary. They're all nothing was compatible. Nothing works anything else. But they got to a point where they started going. Okay, well let's just stand have some standardized stuff, like um, like a uh, uh, teletype terminal. Uh, they they kind of standardized on some some different connectors, which started the whole standardization of connectors uh, trend, which allowed you to plug in all kinds of stuff. Uh, so let's go look at some of the th things they had to say about it. This is um this is a promo video, and I love these little videos. Because they just let you know. I mean, they do kind of show a bit more detail about how things actually are working out. None of the, these things have not changed. It's just the peripherals have changed, but the techniques are what's still going on underneath. It's still the same. I speed it up a little. A digital computer, though it lacks imagination and initiative, does have certain human type capabilities. It can read instructions and data. It can retain what it reads. It can execute instructions. It can calculate data and make simple decisions. And it can write its solutions to problems. These functions are performed by the five major units of the computer. Input is designed to read, storage to retain, control to execute, arithmetic to calculate, and output to write. It is our purpose in this film to each of these, seeing the type of equipment used and its function. The input and output units are called peripheral equipment because they are on the outer edge, as it were, of the computer. Yeah, peripheral. So they're on the peripheral. I didn't know that until I was like, <laughs> until I was like in the computer. was like, why are they called peripherals? Because they're on the periphery of the computer. The computer's on the inside. The, 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 the CPUs on the inside, it talks everything out on the peripheral. <laughs> they may be considered the links between the problem, the computer, and the solution. In a sense, this is so. But we must remember that an input medium and an output medium are necessary parts of the overall system. They are apt to be confused with the computer input and output units, but the distinction should be clear. A computer input serves to read the problem information carried by the input medium and translate it into electrical pulses for storage. Conversely, the computer output serves to write information, translating the output electrical pulses into output medium form. Ones and zeros only. That's the only thing it's dealing with. There's no in-between. Like a peripheral may convert something that's analog, but it's always going to be digital. Never not going to. It's never not going to be digital on a computer. Cards, tape, or printed paper. When the computer input reads the input medium information, the decimal numbers and other data are encoded into binary digits. One type of encoder is a rather simple circuit of four OR gates, with the input designed to receive the decimal numerals, one at a time. Each is converted to a four-bit binary combination, which can be stored. Two, for example, is encoded as 001. This is kind of an inverse of that binary coded, you know, display thing. So uh, you can go look at how that works. Punch cards. The keyboard is used principally for checking the computer operation at various points. Keyboards, yep, yep, keyboards. Data may be transferred onto tape for faster input to the computer. Cards. Incidentally, the first use oh, of punch cards in nurse. history was in the year 1800 for programming the as I, as my grandma. <laughs> of patterns in rugs and carpets. <laughs> my grandma. Can be read in the computer at high rates. Paper tape. The first use of because paper tape is just the same thing as the card punches, except it's little thin strips of paper. This was right before they did the magnetic stuff, because this was so, so many problems with it, as you can imagine, with paper tape. Come on. Punch tape was to accumulate telegraph signals for rapid transmission. But it was for because for teletype. Yeah, it came from cell site. And, there, and there's the so right there, flipped over. I get it. But they still had both going. They still both go at the same time. That's how it always works. It's like overlay technology jumps on top of each other. But always those principles underneath are always the same with these digital te These digital techniques have not changed. It's always the same stuff underneath. On the outside, it changes. The inside, the same stuff. The electric typewriter used for input may also be used to print out the solution in human language. Its best speed, however, is about 15 characters per second, which is far too slow for voluminous data. High-speed printers have been developed for use with computers and output media. 
Wow. In this one, look at that high speed. They got so fast. It, uh, the, with the ones I was working at at school, at my school back in the... Mm. In the 80s, I started going. I, I started high school. And I, I started college when I was 16. So the the ones they had were these huge lights, blind, loud as hell, in this in this big room. And the thing would just be like you would print out your thing. It would be like it'd be like it would be like super fast and ridiculous. And you could go you go through you know five or six pages in like 10 seconds. It was just wicked fast. A little too fast. They had to put a throttle on it because you know, you, as a student, you uh, often make mistakes. You speak up, it would be like cut, cut off. <laughs> I was like, what happened? I don't know. Chain. Another design uses wheels to carry the type. The wheels rotate to place the characters in position for printing. That's that line the printer. By means of <laughs> the each character is printed by wires made to project from a matrix block. That matrix. Each wire being controlled by a magnet. Yeah, I had a bunch of these type printers. They were very popular. Any letter, number, sign, or symbol can be presented and easily read. Input and output devices are constantly undergoing study and development to increase their speed. Oh yeah. Continuing research will result in further advances in the state of the art. Yeah, we we're kicking now ass. Now let's turn to the storage unit, whose function, as we know, is to file data and instructions for use in processing. Symbolically, it resembles the array of mail and message boxes behind the desk of a hotel. Each cell is identified yeah. by a number called its address. This is like RAM. For Random access. Random this access. A small section of the storage unit, which actually may contain thousands of cells. Certain sections of the storage unit may be designated as registers for intermediate storage of data in process and other special uses. That's usually put right on the chip now. The registers they used to keep them separate. Now they keep them all on the, on the chip. So that was a optimization. Instructions may be stored in consecutive addresses, so that when each instruction has been executed, the advance to the next instruction can be made automatically by raising the address number one count. Data are usually stored in separate groups of addresses apart from the instructions to avoid. Uh, some do, some don't. Some interleave it, some leave it separate. It's not a rule. Avoid mix-ups and programming errors. Data are transferred into and out of storage as words containing ten. I mean, they they in Linux and like you know, you know, on Unix based machines, they will keep areas that are just for code. But there's other ones like in JavaScript, you can write a new set of code, right? That's, I mean, that's kind of not really protected. You can write a new function just. Jump to it and go. <laughs> so was that case? You, you can protect the hardware, the, you know, a memory location for the for the chip. But there's another layer up on the on the application. It can do whatever it wants. So forty or more characters or bits. The operation to be performed is given by a code number, space. meaning add, it's subtract, space. or some other operation. In space, yeah. Other parts of the word give the addresses of the data to be used in the operations. I will get into that a little bit. So may be considered as a cylinder with magnetic tapes wrapped around it. The drum is fitted with heads that read and write data, while the drum is constantly rotated at speeds upward of 6,000 like, RPM. So that's when hard disks were, were drum-shaped. And this thing would spin like crazy, but look how big they are. Instead of doing those drums, they would... Thus, they, access time is very short. Since almost each or bit right around this time, many times per second. they did the hard disks. Magnetic yep, are also boom. For storage. Next one. So they just may have the disk and flatten it out. Are and both sides are equally accessible. Discs are a cylinder, you just cylinder and flat it out. Had, that's a bunch of platters. Like they are so huge. Of a few of a second, thus providing excellent access time. Since the access time is virtually the same for all addresses, they can be selected at random, which gives this type of storage its name, random access. Now, this is the, one of the first where they got the name random access is from this stuff because the because the head can go in like this. Well, drum was kind of – well, drum was still sequential because it was just going like that. And there was no head going back and forth. The heads were all, heads were all fixed on the, on the drum that would read. Only certain sections of the drum, and you'd have a drum crash. <laughs> like the drum, the drum. If the drum, if the heads crash, or the because the tongs just had to be so small because it was going so fast, and the uh, and the heads had to be really close because they to get to get to read properly, uh, and and uh, write properly, and then right up this, and I said they had to be really close. Had those heads, the little little magnets that actually magnetize the little pieces of iron had to be super close. And if there's any misalignment <laughs> with those drums, there's always because it's too it was a cylinder. And one of the bearings, if it's just a bearing, just one of the bearings that that keeps the cylinder going, one of those burns out, your head was crashed, all your data is gone. <laughs> so you're like, okay, this can't be done. So instead of that they have these platters now. So you have these platters, and you have the head coming in. instead of like being stuck to the side. They're they're coming in and out. And there's only got one head, and eventually got two heads. And they have like five heads, and there's all of them have heads, and they're all just going. <laughs> so they have all kinds of optimizations until that technology. It's almost it was still here with us a little bit. It's about it's about to die. It's about to be done. There are certain things about it though. It's like when the power goes out, it's still there. 
You know, but if a mechanical half thing happens, which is much more likely, I've had so many hard disks fail. I've had so much data fail. Like once you have something fail on you that is like a hard project to like get back, you just learn we're backing up everything all the time. <laughs> Multiple backups of everything all the time. In contrast to moving or dynamic types. That, of it's, it's not as bad now, these SSDs, but still, it's just, you can't trust it. Computers may use static types. The outstanding one is the magnetic core matrix. It yeah, that was the, rings that was the RAM, early RAM. That was the RAM, right? They started perfecting this core memory right as the transistors came on, and it was like these guys are over. These guys were over for the amount of time, it, for the amount of money it cost to do one bit of transistor versus this. Forget about it. it was game over. So they, this is kind of how it works. You can go in and look at that if you want. And this is how they some of those binary logic works for a couple of half adders. They have these special names for this configuration. They still use these names. This is the standard the na names. It is good to know what these names are, uh, just to know about how how they kind of operate. As a half adder goes into a full adder. So you have a full adder is made up of a different couple of half adders and an or. That's why they call them a half adder because the, the full adder <laughs> it's a couple of half adders and all. And an or okay, there's the sum and the carry, and he'd say we can make it out of tubes. Yep, you can. Uh, but now we're doing a transistor, same exact thing, just a different different schematic symbol, but the same exact principles underneath with the digital electronics. Nothing changes with with uh, analog electronics. Everything is completely bizarro world. I don't can't even imagine living that world. But digital electronics, it's all. One and zero. Is it going to be on or off? There's never going to be in between. If there's, if there's anything on the outside that comes in, it has to be digitized somehow, turn into ones and zeros. Let me talk about that. Uh, so this goes into a little bit of that stuff. This is not a really the greatest explanation about data processing, but this one actually is. Music. Ba -ba. An electronic digital computer is an automatic Here. machine. Meaning, according to Webster, I wanted to work in a place like this so bad. <laughs> Growing up as a kid with all those buttons. <laughs> true. All you have to do is press the start button. I wanted to, to so bad. <laughs> Inside, the control unit directs every step, orders every operation at the proper time, and works in microseconds. <laughs> but control is only obeying orders that have been given to the computer as part of a process that leads logically from the problem to its solution. There is brain work here, but it is concentrated entirely within one phase, the program. The series of instructions detailing the entire operation step by step. Exactly. That's stuff we like to do because, I mean, you can dink around with the digital electronics and see how the buttons and everything work and everything. It is pretty cool to understand how it's like, go me wrong. But after a while, it's like, eh. It becomes, you become aware. Like, once you can kind of build up whatever, you become aware. It's like not the hardware that's the issue anymore. It's that's writing the software to make this thing do something interesting. <laughs> that becomes the issue. It's like this whole other bag of worms opens up. <laughs> Programming is the work of preparing programs. Programmers are the people who do it. The program process may be divided into three steps. Analyzing the problem to determine the factors and the best method of working out a solution. Building a flowchart of the operations to be performed by the computer. You have to build a flowchart, but you do have to kind of like write down the steps, especially in the beginning, like especially when you start the small problems, you build them. It's kind of like useful to like write them down because you can think it through. Uh, or at least sketch it out with pictures and like, hey, this or like label it, you know, like, that's what I like to do. It's like, I don't like to write everything out, but if I can label it the step or whatever, it is useful to do it on paper, uh, at least in the beginning, several times work it out on paper and before you hit the keyboard. I don't know. There's something about that. I've just recommended that to people and they, just, they do that part of it. They just kind of do it in their mind and then they do the, then they go type it in and see how it works. And then they make go and do the paperwork just just in the beginning a few times. Uh, it's super useful, yeah. And coding the instructions, converting them into computer language. It is the purpose. Right, so, so people trying to skip this, uh, the building the flowchart, which is, you know, really analyzing and kind of like sketching out how it's going to work. You know, on paper, there seems to be something about, um, on paper, the woo, I would bring out the woo-woo, a little bit of woo. There's something about putting it on paper that makes it kind of stick in your head more than have to have it on the keyboard. Now I gotta type it in. That's really not where it, that's really not where the work happens. Looks like it, because it's the hacker movies. But um, purpose of this film to show in a brief and general way what is involved in these steps. Paper, working on paper. Good programmers know the subject. 
Yeah, exactly. On a type board like that. That's just, this is the most of what, what you do is you're talking to other people. What do you mean by this? What do you mean by that? What does this do? What does that do? How is this supposed to look? Where is this going to be over here? So you can put this over here, put this over there. Okay. Well, then you go do it and you can bring out, it's like, well, this is wrong and this is wrong and this point and this out, point that out. <laughs> yes, it's, it's constant. That's it. That's pretty fun. I don't know. Check with which the problem is concerned. They also know the computer's methods of operation, its capabilities and limitations. They do not have to understand the electronics and the circuitry, but they do have to understand the functional logic of the computer. Exactly. You don't have to really understand all, all that hardware stuff. Like you, just you don't have to understand, but it definitely helps understand what we are capable of doing, what's going on under the hood, how far we can go with it. What is, you know, you know, what, what is this thing? What are we doing here? Programming involves Useful. defining the problem, selecting the method to be followed by the computer. And but once you know it, you don't need to go back to it anymore. Really. Working out the solution and assembling the raw data to be processed by the computer. Oh, that's fun. As a programmer, you may decide to draw up a process diagram as an aid in getting organized. Such a diagram enables you to set up the facilities the computer will work with. Input medium, output medium, auxiliary storage if needed, and source documents. Now, they had a really, they tried to make this like a, a process, a standardized process. This is kind of where they're getting into here a little bit. You don't have to use a standardized process. We'll get into that as we go down a little further down the software route. Um, you don't have to stand, but you do have to, it is useful to draw things, to communicate to yourself and to other people. Cause it's like, eventually it's going to be, you're going to be working with other people and drawing diagrams and then showing it to people, especially anyone that's in business that's visual. Uh, and also, but the thing is like, when you do the, the visuals with, with the audio, when you could talk about it and point to things, that's when you really can communicate ideas. If you just try and speak, eh. So you're gonna have a hard time. I swear to God. To show the various items. Terrible. The input medium may be punched cards, a file of punched paper tape, or magnetic tape. Auxiliary storage may be magnetic drum. Or it's just some standardized medium. symbols, but you don't have to know these symbols. It's not important. It's just knowing like how this is still, like the basic idea. Hey, the lines, the boxes, you know, the little circles mean things. Input medium may be cards. The database over here. Tape, or reports, which will require the use of a computer system high-speed printer or a typewriter. These symbols, incidentally, have been adopted as military standard. In making up the diagram, you choose the facilities best suited to the problem at hand. Right, they just put, put they just abandon this eventually. Your next step is building the flow chart of the various steps required to process the data. As you decide on the logic to be followed, you construct a chain of symbols that show every operation to be performed from start to finish. These flow chart symbols are from the military standard specifications. This shape is used to indicate the start and the stop of the program process. So I've used a lot of these symbols in this, in this document that goes along with this video series, but uh. You don't have to use the symbols. You can make them up. You can do whatever you want. It doesn't matter. It's not that important. So, but these are kind of some of the standardized ones that kind of people still use a little bit. Where you just, you know, and they kind of make sense. It's like, you know, it's okay. Here's a subroutine. There's an operation stop. I mean, <laughs> get out. My, it was just too slow. It was just too slow. Even with this, even with this guy here, this thing, this little thing, the tracing guy, it was too, 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 too slow. But if you're trying to do like big concepts. Yeah, it's pretty useful. Like here's a, you know. And store, and then act upon. To see in a small way what is involved, let us suppose an operation calls for computing the values of X in this equation. Using it's various more useful values of A, B, C, and D. Do and this printing out the solutions. Do we will follow the process for one set of data, 24, 36, 48, 60. Now the flowchart for this problem is a simple one. The key operations are start, multiply the first two numbers, 24 and 36. Yeah, instead of, instead of, write, numbers, instead of writing out these boxes and lines and, the and stuff products. like that. Print out the answers. Just Right up a hand. Now, when you're communicating to other people, you store the when you're communicating to other people, bigger ideas, this does kind of be useful. It doesn't have to be something as simple as this. This is like a silly example, but it kind of is useful. And especially in these electronic documents, like that's one. It's like, what the hell are you talking about? And it becomes handy. Let's say in these addresses in the computer storage unit. In addition, you will need to include data transfer operations and to express these instructions in computer language, numerical words. Each instruction word is a group of digits, say 10 in this case. You use the first two to specify the types of operation by code numbers such as. Well, that's not necessarily true. Uh, uh, in the computers of the 1962, the model that they were training these guys on. Yeah, yeah, of course. But no, so they still have this instruction word that still is the name of the uh, opera, operand, operation, op code, is what they call it. This is the, so the, this operation code. Um, but it's not necessarily this, this configuration here, but this, this, this is how it works. 21 you know. for transfer from storage and multiply. Yeah. 22 for transfer from storage and add. Right. This is random. For transfer from accumulator. With different CPUs, it's random. And this is from different areas of the CPU. Like, well, from the RAM, 
or from some place off the storage, storage from RAM someplace, storage someplace, and then you multi, and then you bring it into the you know, and then you're doing the, a, 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 a multiply operation. Yeah, you know, there's different ways of arranging it. This is super old timey, uh, but it's still the same ideas. Same basic fun concept. Effing, effing. <laughs> the next four digits and the final four will represent storage addresses of data. <laughs> now the first instruction word is this. Transfer from storage and multiply the contents of address 2001 by the contents of address 2002. Note that the instruction does not contain the data to be processed, just the addresses where they are stored. Obeying this instruction, then, the computer will multiply 24 by 36. And if, like most computers, we'll leave the result, 864 in this case, in the accumulator in the arithmetic unit. Right. So they still use that same terminology. That's like, it's like, it kind of predates a little bit uh, computers. So that's why there's this kind of standardized terminology. Your next instruction word is this. Transfer from accumulator to storage the contents of the accumulator, which may be indicated by 9999 to storage address 2005. For the next step, the instruction word is transfer from storage and multiply the contents of address 2003 by the contents of address 2004. The product is 2880. Instruction word number four transfers the product from the accumulator to storage address 2006. Word number five calls for transferring from storage and adding the contents of 2005 and 2006. That is 864 plus 2880. The next instruction is to transfer from the accumulator to storage address 2007. The result, 3744. So you can see why they changed they, the, from these opcodes. This is like right as their assembly language is starting to come online. I mean, as they're just starting to do that, where they were still doing this old, you know, base ten. Everything's base ten here, um, and you are you are these number these number opcodes are still is you're still programming in the opcodes like this. It's like super, woo, hardcore. This is right before assembly language. Right around this time, assembly language is coming online. So we had actually words for this be like load, multiply, divide. You can see how confusing this would get. <laughs> so they, so there was a, they started humanizing this stuff right about this time, about a year, a year right at this year. But to film this film was probably started in sixty one, and they finished. Yeah, so they finished. They started doing this in sixty two, sixty three. So by the time this is this is already obsolete, but it came out. And the last instruction number seven will. Words to store it can advance for the addition. Automations are easily set up. So you can watch the rest of that. Signals. Oh, check out that keyboard. Whoa, that thing's super. Or frequently used instructions can be stored in the computer, ready for use at any time. There, look at that thing. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Called upon by special code <laughs> signals. <laughs> Thus, oh, electronic digital good. computers, each year incorporating improvements that increase their versatility and productivity, take on more and more of man's work. You have no idea. All right. Um, so, that's those two. Okay. Yeah. So, here. So, Hooking everything up requires a bus. And there's this thing that's super confusing the first time I heard it is called tri-state. And it's like, what do you mean in a computer you have three states? Well, okay, you can have free floating, not hooked up to anything, hooked up to the power, or hooked up to the ground. <laughs> to not hooked up is called a third state. All right, whatever. But there's a per there's a certain reason why you want to have it not hooked up, and let's look at it. Uh, why that might be a, a thing when you so we have multiple devices on the bus at the same time. You only want to communicate at one at a time. You don't want all of them communicating on the same on the same line at the same time. So that's what this is about. Imagine we have just four components, each of which needs to be able to receive data from any of the other three. We could build a slightly larger version of our multiplexer to handle this, so here the other three chips would all send their data to chip A, and there'd be some selection signals to choose between those, which I've left out here just So this thing is like a multiplexer, so it's taking in all the so it's taking in data from one of these chips in these all these inputs here and outputting out to one. So this this there's some there's gonna be some way to to switch between these three somehow, some way. And that you choose one input that goes out here. So it's called a multiplexer. Ooh. For simplicity. Then, of course, Chip B wants access to all that data as well. So it could have its own multiplexer. And same goes for Chip C and D as well. Yeah. The problem with this approach, really, is just the obscene amount of wires we're going to have running all over the place. And while it's conceptually very simple, I think it might end up being a bit confusing to keep track of what's going on. So it'd definitely be nice if we could use a more minimalistic approach. 
What we could try doing instead is creating a set of shared wires for transferring data called a bus. These bus lines can run through the computer wherever they're needed, and any of the chips can read data from the bus or write data onto the bus for anyone else to read. One slight caveat there, though, is that while all the chips can read from the bus simultaneously, only one chip can actually write data to the bus at a time. Otherwise, there's going to be conflicting data, and we'll look into that a bit more in a minute. One solution to this problem would be to use a multiplexer. We could have one big one over here, and instead of any of the chips writing to the bus directly, they could all send their outputs to the multiplexer, which would permit only one of the data sources onto the bus at a time. Since there are four sources to choose from here, we'd need two selection signals to cover all the possibilities, and let's just wire those up quickly, and then output the results onto the bus. Currently, the data from chip C is going onto the bus. I wired them up in a bit of a strange order, but anyway, we could change the selection signal. So this select is basically saying, you know, if it's if it's both zero, do, do A. If it's this is one and this is zero, do B. If it's zero and one, do C. If it's one and one, do D. That's all this thing is doing right here. That's all. That, so this is just one way of wiring it up. Signal here to let the output from chip A through instead, or from chip B, or lastly from chip D. This is a good solution, I'd say, but it is a bit awkward that we have to run all our wires to this giant multiplexer. It would be really nice, at least in terms of keeping our wires tidy, if each chip could just put its data onto the bus right where it is. To better understand the problem with this and how we might get around it, I'd like to venture out into the real world for a moment and take a look at this little 4-bit register. Looking at its datasheet, we have power and ground pins, of course, and then these here are our four data input. And this guy's awesome. He does these really great videos. Sebastian Lang. Yeah, go ahead and give him a like and subscribe. Um, he did that. He actually did the wrote the software. There's all that binary stuff because he's just exploring it. The guy's like a genius. He's got at least 140 IQ. And output pins. There's also a clock input over here and a reset input here, which we don't have in our simulated version, but it just clears the data to zero. Then at the bottom, somewhat confusingly, we have these two pins together making up the store signal. They both need to be zero in order for the store signal to be on, and I'm sure there's a good reason for that, but I have no idea what it is. Finally, at the top are these two pins. See? He's like me. He's like, I'm just getting in here. I don't know. I'm just checking things out and like bumbling my way through and just trying to figure out things out. Yeah, so this is, so yeah, he is now, I don't know. I don't know, does anybody know? Put it in the comments like super below, but it's like that kind of stuff like, eh, we don't really need to know, we keep going. Inputs, which like the store signal are really just a single input and what it does, well, we'll get there in a minute. First of all though, I've got some wiring to do. Hopefully I'm setting this up. So he's actually watched Ben Eater because Ben Eater was the first person always, I've ever seen wire it up his stuff this way so you can, it's so obvious what is going on so here's the power the red rail is is this goes all the way line this this blue here is the power and he uses i mean the red is the power the, the positive and then this little blue line here is, is the negative which he usually people use as black but he uses this blue i think it's okay, cool on this stuff is still extremely tenuous i've been thinking though and this one you know you, anything that's on this wire gets 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 uh connected uh connected together anything on this wire is connected together so the, the, anything on the red rail is connected together, anything on the blue rail is connected together. And anything in these in this inner inner block, these these lines here go the other way. They go this way. So anything that's on this line is connected together. Anything on this line is connected together. Anything on this line is connected together. Any, so all these all these things, and then there, it's broken here in the middle. And then everything on this side is connected together. And this side, this side. That's why it splits down the middle that way about making some sort of series to explore the world of electronics in more depth, because I do find it extremely fascinating. So let me know if that sounds at all interesting. In any case, I've finished setting this up here, so let's now use these tiny switches to enter some data. Yeah, so just be clear, so this is all negative, this is all positive, and this is all positive, and that's all negative, and then these all lines all come together. So this pin is connected to this, and this, and this, and they've keyed their little jumper here. So these two pins are connected together to this ground, right? And then here's got the here's got the power here. He's got this, he's, it's the red one here is is always usually positive, and the black one here is usually always negative. Always uh, on electronics, uh, digital electronics at least. Then I've set the store signal to just always be enabled for this example. So all we need to do is make the clock signal go from low to high, and we can see that our data has been loaded into the register. Just to fully test that this is working though, let's try entering something else like zero one one zero and clock that in. All right, that's looking good. So now the first thing I want to do here is just quickly remind ourselves what these ones and zeros we're working with all the time actually represent. These little green LEDs are all connected to ground at the top. So the ones that are on must have been electrically connected to the power pin inside the chip, meaning that a one just represents a connection to a high voltage, somewhere around five volts in this case. On the other hand then, a zero represents a connection to a low voltage, something at least close to zero volts. So I'd imagine that the lights that are off should be connected to the ground pin inside of the chip. So it doesn't make it clear, but this is, this is power and this is ground. We can confirm if that's actually the case by just grabbing one of the lights that's off and turning it around to connect to the power rail up here instead. And we can see it does light up, so it must be connected to ground on the other end. That's cool that you did that. This kind of output is called a push-pull output, because by connecting to power for a one or ground for a zero, it allows current to flow in either direction, which I guess is kind of like pushing and pulling electrons. Yes. 
That is exactly how they see it. <laughs> so, okay, whatever. It's just these words. All right. They mean they mean something very specific. It's usually like, what the hell are you talking about? Push pill. Oh, whatever. Push pulling electrons. Oh, okay. There are other types of outputs with various trade-offs, but let's just focus on this kind for today. So returning to the simulation for a moment, let's say we have some chip that's outputting a 1 onto the bus, which as we've just seen is essentially connecting it to its power pin, and another chip that's outputting a 0 onto the bus, essentially connecting it to its ground pin. What we have now is a very low resistance path between the two, which means it will get an excessive amount of current flow, potentially damaging some components and causing glitches due to unexpected data on the bus. That's the problem. This undesirable stage is called a bus contention, and in Yeah, bus contention, that's what it's called. And, and dreaded. Dreaded. So that we all, all engineers go through a lot of trouble to make sure this never ever happens, because if it does, what is the state of this? When this one's saying go to ground, this one says go to because it says put power on the line. This other chip says no, you go to ground. What is it going to go through? It's not going to go to the bus anymore. It's going to go through the, the, to this thing. So you're going to put power into the ground where it doesn't really it's not expecting to. Oop. And then also this line goes up and down, up and down, up and down. It doesn't like it's indeterminate. They call it indeterminate state. They're like little funny words for like we don't know what the hell's going on. <laughs> This is bad. This is that's why it's like doot doot doot. <laughs> the simulation is just represented with an annoying flickering to show that something's gone wrong and the bus doesn't know what value it's supposed to be. Yeah, that's that's super cool that you put just that in there. Let's return to our mystery input over here. Because that's exactly what happens. You know, your thing will be like, why is this not working? So it'll maybe be like stuck in one position or it'll act strange and it's like, oh, okay, this is why. All this does is simply allow us to control whether the outputs are enabled or not. So I wired up this button on the left to act as a disable outputs button, and if I press that, we can see that all the lights turn off. Inside of the chip, all the outputs which previously were connected to either power or ground become essentially disconnected instead. This third possible state, neither one nor zero, goes by different names such as floating. Floating, because it's disconnected, it's just, we're not connected to anything, so there's connected and floating. <laughs> Let's really call it floating. I have asked people what this meant, a lot of different people, and they never just said it just means disconnected. That's all it means. They're like, well, it means the data transfer and the data and the data and the, the the power supply. And it's, it means it's it's just not connected. That's it. Ping or high impedance or tri-stated. But the point is that if these outputs were connected to a bus, <laughs> tri-stated. Be having any effect on it, and so some other chip would not be free to put it. I hate. I, this is one of the most annoying things about this field is because it was. Pencil nerd, pencil geek, you know, uh, 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 oh. <laughs> but pocket protecting wearing, you know, nerd glasses, just totally goofy. And they had to make up all these crazy words for this very specific stuff. And it is a bit off putting, I swear to God. And then if you ask people and they haven't gone, and done the gauntlet of like, well, what do you mean by that? Or like, what have you gone into? What are you, what are you talking about? And not even asked. Like, I've never asked that question. They just like, just talk without knowing this kind of stuff. And they, you, they don't know. And you call, and their little ego gets hurt because they really want to know all the stuff without actually knowing all the stuff. Instead, I'd like to take a very quick look at how this works. So imagine that this here is one of the outputs from our chip. The basic idea is that internally, the output is connected to two transistors. Then if the chip wants to output a one, there'd be some logic to turn on this transistor here, which provides a connection to the power pin. On the other hand, if the chip wants to output a zero, it would turn on the other transistor, which provides a connection to the ground pin. Finally, if the chip is asked to disable its outputs, then it will just make sure that neither transistor is on, which means that the output is effectively disconnected, because when the transistors are off, they're going to be extremely reluctant to let any current flow through them. Right, so it's disconnected. Uh, so when it's on over here, off over here, or disconnected. So it's really a one, really a zero, or... Und undeterminate. <laughs> Just to demonstrate this sort of thing, it's zero and disconnected to look exactly the same. Not, a, not the there! Which isn't going to a light, but rather to the input of some other chip. Now, what can happen in this disconnected state is that some sort of electrical noise can come along and interfere with that input, causing it to randomly float from zero to one, or vice versa. If we're outputting a zero here, though, for example, we can see that that little bit of noise is no longer able to interfere with the input, because we're providing this strong connection to ground. All right, hopefully that makes some sort of sense, but in any case, let's head back to the simulation, where I quickly programmed in a new type of building yeah, that's what called I, the tri-state buffer. It's mostly the bus contention issue that's the problem, not floating and having other something scream in it's a bus contention you can't have two chips saying one or zero it's not going to work it's going to be it's bad it's a bad idea it's bad it's it's gonna gonna make the thing not work right with this we can connect up an input and an enable signal and all this does is output whatever value it receives as input so either zero or one unless of course the enable signal is turned off in which case it goes into this third disconnected state that i've been hopping on about 
So just for convenience, let's make a little chip that has an output enable signal along with four data inputs, which it can then pass through four of these new tri-state buffers. I'll then wire up the output enable signal to each of the buffers, and then of course wire up their outputs. This just gives us a nice easy way to take our nibble, which is the name for half a byte or four bits of data, and disable it. <laughs> nibble. <laughs> I forgot that they call it four bytes is a nibble because uh, four bits is a byte. Ah! <laughs> four bytes is two hours a little nibble. Because <laughs> that's the minimum. That's the minimum size that the CPU can eat. Because <laughs> an address usually just uh, is is pointing to one byte on the earlier computers when it's you know, eight series eight bits as they call it a byte because that's how much the CPU can anyway or any bit depending on whether we want it going onto the bus or not so we can just quickly <laughs> computer and people it bus funny. then going back to our little test here let's try using that to replace this one big multiplexer so we can see which approach we like better now instead of these two selection signals we're going to need an output enable signal for each chip so this is going to require some extra wires but on the right side it'll at least be possible to give them meaningful names now I know I put these in a bit of a strange order here, but I just wanted to be able to connect them up without getting too many wires crossed. Anyway, let's try this out quickly. So starting at the bottom, I'll enable the output of chip B. Then let's switch to D, and then C, and finally chip A. So that's looking pretty good, I'd say. Although one potential pitfall with this approach is that unlike with the multiplexer, we could mess up and have multiple chips trying to output their data simultaneously. Right. Bus contention. Related to that, when I was reading the data sheet of that 4-bit register we were playing with, I was interested to learn that it was designed so that disabling the outputs would take effect slightly more quickly than enabling them to minimize the chance of a conflict. Thankfully, we don't have to worry about any of these subtle timing considerations from the safety of our simulation. So let's try working with this three-state bus approach because I think it's going to make it a lot easier to stay organized, especially in the future if we're working with more than just a handful of chips. I'd like to test the setup with our actual chips though, so I've set up some inputs over here, starting with four data inputs, then some output enable signals, some other control signals, and finally the clock. Let's create a 4-bit bus quickly, and then we can grab one of our buffers and use it to allow this incoming data here onto the bus if the data output signal is enabled. I gotta say this, this program is so awesome. If I had this, it would have made my life so much easier when I was taking the digital electronic course. And having to build all this stuff out, it took so long. It took such a long time. Ridiculous for the little result. Now, I'm glad I did it. No, get me wrong. I'm glad I did it. I started doing this when I was a little kid. You know, I was eight years old. I started doing my first digital electronics. Did a binary code, to, to, uh, to PCD to seven uh, segment display uh, kit from Radio Shack. <laughs> but it still it took me hours. Then let's also bring in two four-bit registers. To do this. On the bus, and also put data out onto the bus. Then to do some simple maths, let's bring in our little ALU. Now this is a bit awkward because it takes in two 4-bit numbers, so instead of using the bus, let's make an exception here and just edit its inputs directly from our two registers. It can then put the result out onto the bus though. Okay, there are just a few control signals that need to be wired up, so I'll do that quickly. We're almost running out of workspace here already, so I'm going to have to make some more upgrades to the program soon, but I'll worry about that later. For now, let's just connect the clock to our two registers, and then it's time awesome. to see how this works. It's awesome to see all this stuff together. The bus. Then let's tell register A to store that value and pulse the clock so that it actually happens. All right, then let's maybe try using our ALU to add the contents of the two registers together yeah, and so the I'm result in register B here. So first of all, let's make sure that only the ALU is at the state on the bus. We can then tell register B to store whatever value is currently on the bus, and then to make that happen, let's pulse the clock again. All right, so we've just solved the very complex math problem 3 plus 0, thrilling stuff. Let's run the clock a few more times to just keep adding the value in register A to the value in register B. Okay, we've ended up with 15 in here, and now I want to try copying this value into register A. So let's set that up quickly. We want the output from register B on the bus, we want to store it in register A, and finally, as always, we'll pulse the clock. Everything seems to be working, which is nice. But for That's pretty cool. So you can go look at the rest of that. I just want to show you that bus part, how what about the bus contention. That's the most important thing. Um, how RAM works. How does RAM store information? RAM is constructed of microscopic strands etched into the silicone of the memory chip. You can think of these electrical strands as pipes, like plumbing through which electricity flows. Some pipes represent addresses, while others carry data. Now let's say we want to store the letter A in RAM. First, the PC opens a section of memory by sending a burst of electricity across the address pipe. This electric burst closes a group of miniature switches known as transistors, but only the ones needed for the data along that address line. Next, the actual information is sent as electric bursts across the address lines. Each burst is called a bit, and there are eight bursts traveling on eight lines, in this case to represent the letter A. In the computer's code, the letter A looks like this. Each burst travels through a closed switch and charges a capacitor. The turned on capacitors represent the ones. The uncharged capacitors are considered zeros. Because all capacitors lose their charge over time, bursts of electricity continuously flow to refresh them. Yeah, it's called DRAM. Uh, most, of this, most of the stuff is set up, is set, was set up like that before the SSD stuff came along. They do it a completely different way. And this is, um, he shows how a RAM module is put together. I'm not gonna like go through all that stuff, but he shows how these, how actual RAM, RAM module is put together. Ben Eater again. Uh, and I'm just gonna go through and show how he programmed it. Um, these are all the RAM chips here and uh, how he set them up, which is just digital electronic chips. It's not DRAM, not that capacitor charge stuff. This is just regular old 
7404. Uh, I think it's I think it's a NAND gate. It's a RAND gate. Well, you'll you just you'll check it out. You can check it out. B on both of these chips together. And just finished building it right there. We've got our right signal here, and it is a active low. So if it's high, then we're not writing. And then if we bring this low, then that'll write whatever data is here into our chips. So let's power it up again and uh, see what's going on. So, yeah, and you'll notice when we power it up, uh, you get kind of a random, random data. Okay, now it's consistent, but it's different than it was before. I don't know. But in any event, normally when you power it up, you just kind of have state. some kind of garbage in the memory and, mm -hmm. until, until we actually write it. So right now we've got a zero going in here. So if we change our write enable, it writes that zero now to that address. Yeah, that's something you should know about like a memory is like, it normally is just, it's just random stuff. Usually when you're, if you're going to be looking at it on like a, 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 in a display or a debugger or whatever, if you're looking at it, it's usually just going to be random bits. And of course that's address. It starts up. So some computers will clear it out, but some computers don't. Uh, and because it just takes time to do that. And there's why, why do it? And it doesn't matter. It's going to be allocated and written over anyway. Zero, if we go to address one, we see we have some other garbage in there and we can write a zero to that. Okay, uh, or we could write something else. Remember, th these are our inputs. So we have, you know, zero, 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 but let's change this bit here to a one. So it's zero, zero, one, zero, zero, zero. Now, if we write that, there we go. We get that written to address memory location one. Of course, we go back to address zero. We still have the zero that we put there. If we go back to address one, we get that data that we put there. Let's try going to address I don't know, this is three, right? You no, know, he's just using wires here. No switches. Just using wires, just plugging them back and forth to do the, to do the as to simulate switching. This, this is one of the things that's so great about Ben's channel is uh, he just does this for us. Zero, zero. This is exactly what you need to do to understand how it works, honestly. One, one in binary, that's three. Um, and let's... You know, we get some garbage in there or whatever. Let's just write some other little data pattern here. So let's just alternate bits. So computers, so computer software people, software engineers, software programmers will call an unexpected value or value that's like left over from something else a garbage value. <laughs> okay. So this is zero one zero one zero one zero one, and if we take our write enable low for a moment, it writes that data into address three. And of course, if we go back to address one, we get what we put there. If we go back to address zero, we should have a zero there. Uh, and it looks like we've got our memory working pretty well. So he goes and builds the whole chip up and he shows you how it works, the diagrams and how it's all wired together. It's so awesome to go know, to know how that stuff works. Uh, okay, then, uh, so how did they, um, what about um, uh, uh, the old video cameras and video tubes? The CCD, the video camera, how do they do that? Well, pff, once they got the transistor, it wasn't a far because the photoelectric effect worked that worked on the tubes also worked on the transistor. So the tubes were huge, right? But the transistors get real small. So they could put a whole bunch of them. So they just did, well, we'll see how, we'll see what they did. Watch this. The invention and development of miniature solid-state devices have spawned much of today's technology. Transistor. Computers, copiers, calculators, cameras. One important innovation is the charge couple device, or CCD, a versatile new type of semiconductor invented in 1969 by Willard S. Boyle and George E. Smith of Bell Telephone Laboratories. Their invention is finding growing use in a wide spectrum of engineering applications for signal processing and communications, for information storage in computer systems, and for image sensing in solid state television cameras where the small CCD eliminates the need for the bulky vacuum tube and the scanning electron beam required by standard TV cameras today. Yeah, it was like more accurate. It, I'm Bill Boyle. And I'm George Smith. The image that you see on the TV screen of both of us is being produced by this small CCD camera which is directly in front of us here. This camera was made originally for a picture phone type of application. This uh, shows what a color camera is like when you make one using CCDs. Uh, you can look inside here and see these three shiny things down here. First these are the CCD devices. Stuff. And they get the three colors from a prism, which is up in this area. You still see the yeah, here. And the, 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 the discrete logic be contrasted on side. To a studio color camera, which is shown up here. The CCD is designed to store and transfer information in the form of electrical charge. Here it is seen in cross-section. 
It consists of a piece of semiconductor material coated with an insulator. A pattern of metal electrodes is positioned on the insulator, and every third electrode is connected to a common conductor. To show how the CCD works, we will transistor, slow down the action. Transistor, transistor, when there transistor, is voltage transistor, on electrode, transistor, transistor, a potential transistor, well forms transistor, in the semiconductor transistor, beneath transistor, it. Transistor. In the case of the TV camera, the amount of charge that fills a well depends on the amount of light striking that area of the CCD. Yeah, the photoelectric effect. To the next electrodes, potential wells form under them, and part of the stored charge shifts over to the new well areas. When voltage is removed from the original electrodes, it pumps it the along. charge in their wells spills <laughs> over into the like new wells. Like a little wave. And this process continues down the line of electrodes to a detector. For other uses of CCDs, such as memory, signal processing, and logic, charge enters one end by electrical means in the form of a telephone signal or computer input, for example, and is transferred ah, then along the CCD, as we have seen, and is detected at the opposite end. One of the things that makes the CCD unique like a is its ability to perform specialized functions, such as acting as a camera or as a memory device, which can be used in computers or in certain kinds of so-called signal processing functions, where we are using the CCD device for controlling the shape and quality of signals. We have an imaging device here, which is the sort of blackish square thing in the center, which has 250,000 elements on it. This is a standard commercial size TV camera, or the sensor development for it. Of course, you need electronics to run it. The, uh, once they got to the one element that worked, they just duplicated it. <laughs> and watch what they say. The CCD, because of its uh, very uh, compact form, offers the possibility for having electronic memories of much lower cost uh, than we have today. The thing with uh, memory is to get it very small and compact. And there are uh, 16,000 memory elements on this chip. Not only that, but we have also put on this little chip all of the circuit elements needed to run the memory chip. The uh, CCD offers uh, several advantages over the more conventional integrated circuits. Uh, first, it is much more compact in size. It is possible to arrange um, as marking spiel What would be required if we were using conventional integrated circuits? Another application is logic which can be a very complicated function What I have here is a photograph of our first logic chip which shows a very simple function What we do up on top here is to put in either a 1 or a 0 and on, on the bottom we get out either a 0 or a 1 Or the opposite of what you put in. Right. It's a very simple it's, okay, it's function a And you may be able to see the individual plates down here which form the CCD I mean, it's, it's just there all transistor stuff. There's the, course, they're trying to make us think it's like it's real special a chip nowadays, It's not that special very complicated But, logic functions. another approach The last application, and perhaps one more exciting one in my mind pants. is for analog signal Woo! <laughs> This is an analog signal processing chip here, which is just a delay line. To give you some idea of what this is, you can imagine a delay line. If you just put in an analog signal on one side, it takes a certain amount of time for the signal to go through, and you get out the other side. One very simple application here is to take a, a sound wave and, and uh, a, a delay the sound wave and add it to the uh, undelayed sound wave, and this sort of causes an echo effect. One can use this in a high vice uh, studio, for instance, in order to get some very strange effects. And you can do many, many more complicated. Uh, echo, ooh, echo. Ooh. These versatile devices had an unusual beginning, where the innovation process often takes months or years. The conception and development of the CCD was startlingly fast. Well, back in 1969, when we first invented uh, the CCD, the silicon technology, which is the technology that we use in order to make these devices, the silicon technology was being used for integrated circuits. It was just sort of coming into its own in uh, large-scale circuit use. So all of the technology that we needed for these devices was there. All it needed was a concept. Then uh, one day, rather spontaneously, uh, George uh, Smith and I were having a discussion of possible new kinds of uh, devices, and we literally, uh, almost spontaneously, came upon the notion of using the uh, charge couple device principle uh, to be able to perform analogous functions to magnetic bubbles. The CCDs uh, were actually invented in about one hour. So magnetic bubbles, there it is. CCDs were invented in one hour. To magnetic bubbles. Magnetic bubbles, it, okay, they were trying to do bubble memory. It was, it was a dead end. But it, listen to this guy. The CCDs uh, were actually invented in about one hour. Uh, we uh, drew some diagrams on the blackboard, made some order of magnitude calculations to satisfy ourselves that our ideas were based on reasonably sound physical principles. Well, right after the initial concept, after this one hour of uh, invention, more or less, went back and wrote things up in a notebook, as we were all trained to do immediately. Too many times good ideas get lost. And, um, in fact, I have the original... Those pants, <laughs> not a good idea. <laughs> ...notebook right here, which is growing a little old right now, but the initial drawing that was made here, shown on this page, uh, showing a cross-section of the device, is essentially still valid today. The, basic device is still at the same simple way as it was described in this book. We decided to make a device. That took about three days to fabricate, and then we measured it and verified the uh, concept of this device in oh, less than a week. 
Yeah, because the LED gives off light when you when you power it. The the transistor will give off infrared light, and infrared light comes in. It'll give off electricity. Ooh, I mean, very good about it. They make it seem like it's such a big discovery. It's like okay, it's clever. Don't get me wrong. Props, you were there at the time, but it took one hour, so it's not that big a deal. <laughs> Um and yeah, this is the last one. Data processing principles. File maintenance is so important in any data processing system that we will talk about it. In these the, these kinds of ideas w were the basis of the procedural languages that came out from this era, uh, and it's important to know how they were thinking about uh, processing data. Sunny tale, but first let's take a look at the big picture. The very first input to any data processing system is some kind of source document such as a change of address notice or an employee timesheet. Yeah, that's the conceptual. If they, if they put it on like, it's like, it's like a card thing, but it was, this is the conceptual level. The source document is used to key punch transaction cards. So this All is the media medium. Cards are key verified to make sure they've been punched correctly. Right now, all we use is the keyboard. I mean, other we use cameras and stuff like that, but we don't use these stuff anymore. This is like way too low throughput for what we need. Even so, many errors manage to creep in. Yeah, from this. To catch this these is not errors, stopped. We must never end. One by one into the computer and check them for validity. This includes checking proper codes for no alphabetic data in numeric fields, consistency, reasonableness, and so forth. Well, uh, reasonableness so, and so forth. All it does is, okay, so it'll go check to see if that account actually exists. If the name is correct, if there's like if the numbers are went out out of whack, out of one order of magnitude out of whack, or out of place because you had to put things in certain places on these cards, oh man! And the only way to know if it was right is the run through the machine have it rejected. <laughs> there were so many mistakes from this stuff. When an error is detected by the validity check program, that card is not written on tape. Instead, it must be returned. Kick back. Corrected. And re-entered into the system. So that would take so much. That would take so much time. Right now, it's like it, you hit the dialog box. You hit the wrong button, and it tells you like right away. But this takes you know, an hour. Error messages can also be printed. Because the user was the type of the stuff in, he would give it the stack of stuff. He wouldn't put it to the computer himself or herself. He would have to go someplace else, check it in, have it entered. Then an hour later, two hours later, after it got it in, in order, because there's people in line before the person, <laughs> it gets kicked out. It's just it's so, so frustrating. <laughs> when all of the transaction cards have been checked, record counts can be printed. Let's review. Cards are key punched and key verified to produce a deck of transaction cards. And they still call these things transactions in the software. They still call them transactions with the tra your transaction uh, item. Your you know the, the thing that comes in is your what you want to do. Do you want to do so, do you want to put money into the account? You want to take the money out of the account? You want to transfer from one account to the other account? Do you want to close your account? You're trying to open an account. Cards are read into the computer one at a time and checked for validity. The good cards are written on tape, and error cards are sent back to be repunched. At the end, messages and error counts are printed. Because we're dealing with a sequential file, the good transactions must be sorted into the same sequence as the master file. For example, if hey. transactions are employee time cards, we might sort them into employee number sequence. When the sort is complete, it produces messages and counts. Which must be the count of how many are good, how many are bad, how many are this one, how many are that one, how many in this area of town, how many are this area of this area of town, how many this how many are open accounts, how many close accounts. How many, you know, transfer accounts? Manually inspected and compared to the validity check run to be sure that nothing has gone wrong. After they're sorted, the good transactions must be read again and processed against the old master file. This is mostly banking operations, but any kind of computer insurance stuff, insurance records, all that stuff was done this way in these big batches. And things at that still at the bottom level of all those computers that was still done that way. New master file. This step is called file maintenance. Again, messages and counts which are printed must be inspected. This time they must be checked against the sort run counts. Often during file maintenance, records are collected on one or several files. 
for later input to a report preparation program. That'd be the your output screen you did. Oh, I'll just play. Oh, okay, there's my all my accounts and well, there's my transactions and all the list of them for my bank. <laughs> so they they separated it out quite a bit back then. These big bulky steps. It wasn't just one fluid thing. Uh, or one seemingly fluid. It's still underneath. We just, engineers think of it this way for sure. For sure. Additionally. Other special files will be needed to provide more information to produce certain reports. Again, counts are kept for manual inspection. Yeah, all that kind of stuff we still do today, for sure. These are the typical steps involved in sequential processing of commercial files. They are, of course, highly simplified, and an actual application may involve many more programs, but the basic steps are these. Key punch and key verify transaction cards. Check for validity. You can watch that. They're just going to repeat it again. So, um, yeah, that's... So we got the RAM, DRAM, da -da 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 processing, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, okay, flow charts. Yeah, okay, that's about it for this uh, for this episode. I'll, I got coming up next. We're gonna get to the next section, data structures. Woo, data structures, so much fun. Actually, it's the life of a software developer is data structures.